Welcome back class, I'm Professor G. Um, I want to take this video, uh, take a chance this video to summarize very quickly, um, not a very detailed summary, but just sort of a general overview of World War I, some of the major events that happened in World War I. I should begin by saying that World War I is such a even though it's a relatively short period of time, even though we're only talking about four years of human history, um, the events that happen here are so catastrophic, are so huge, are so earth shattering, um, that it's gonna be basically impossible for me to cover World War I in any real depth in the amount of time that I have. So I would encourage you to look elsewhere, uh, to look to some outside readings, uh, to look into some other YouTube videos. There's a lot of excellent sources out there about World War I. Um, but I just want to take a brief opportunity now to give you a general overview and to try as best as I can to capture um, some of the major developments. And what is perhaps the biggest development here? The, one of the most important things that happens during World War I and as a result of World War I is our, uh, a change in how we understand and how we process war. People are going to have a really, really hard time coming to grasp, coming to understand what exactly happened and why it happened. World War I is going to introduce warfare and death at a literally unimaginable level. People couldn't comprehend the amount of people who died and how they died. And there's really no comparison here, right? If you look at the 19th century, if you look at the, the conflicts of the 19th century, for example, one of the major conflicts of the 19th century, specifically for us Americans, is the Civil War. The Civil War is one of the watershed events in American history, the pivotal moment, right? And if you look at uh, how much life is lost, if you look, for example, the Battle of Antietam, one of the first, uh, the first battle of the Civil War, and you, you see people's responses, right? You've heard the stories of people going out to picnic to watch the fighting and the carnage that took place afterwards, okay? If you take the entirety of the Civil War. It's the most soldiers the United States has ever lost in any war because they were all Americans, both North and South. Uh, if you take the entire year, you're talking about 200,000 people, 200,000 Americans who lost their lives during the Civil War. That happens in about a month in World War I. In one month, more lives will be lost during World War I than the entire Civil War combined. And people, this is what I mean when I say there's no parallel here. There's, no, there's nothing to compare what is happening in World War I to. There's no, there's no means of comparison. We simply couldn't comprehend what was happening. And this is largely due to the sort of technology that's in play. This is largely due to the, the mindset of the generals and some of the uh, political developments that took place. But the, the staggering death toll really, really takes its toll on the European psyche and on the Western, not just the European psyche, but on the Western psyche, right? World War I is called the suicide of the modern world, right? How could this happen? Why did this happen? And it's really the first time, it's the first time in history that we are brought face to face with the collapse of civilization as we know it. For the very first time in, during World War I, we realize that life as we know it, that civilization, that structure, that government, that it's fragile, that it's possible for it not to be. And this is exactly what happens during World War I, we come close to the brink. We come close to collapse. So World War I, um, spanning from the year 1914 to 1918, um, the war is going to put 
uh, we're going to have two different powers here, the central powers and the allies. Um, be careful here not to confuse terminology between World War I and World War II. Okay, in, the, in World War II you're going to have the Axis and the Allies, and some of the Allies are going to be the same, but some of them aren't. Okay, so you have to pay careful attention here to who is who. Uh, so during World War I, uh, it pitted the Central Powers, and the Central Powers were mainly talking about uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey. Now there's a, uh, there's a weird shift, uh, not weird, but there's a shift that happens uh, with Italy. Uh, Italy for our purposes, it's considered uh, part of the Allies. Um, the Italians actually entered a pact with Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, the Triple Alliance. Uh, basically, World War I is all about uh, private negotiations between countries saying, hey, if this happens, I got your back. If that happens, I got your back. Well, Italy had actually made an agreement with both Germany and Austria-Hungary saying if war broke out, uh, then they would side with them. Uh, well, Italy actually doesn't do that. Uh, the war breaks out and Italy just kind of hangs around for about a year and will eventually side with the Allies with the hopes of gaining uh, Austria-Hungary territory. But, so for, for our purposes, the central powers include Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Turkey, Turkey being the Ottoman Empire here. Okay? Uh, the Allies, uh, by that we mean France, Great Britain, Russia, Italy, and Japan. Uh, and from 1917 uh, to 1918, uh, the United States as well. Okay, so you want to get these straight, right, because in World War II, uh, Japan is part of the Axis. Japan actually allies with Germany, but we'll, we'll get to all that later. Uh, so World War I is going to end with the defeat of the Central Powers, end with the defeat of Germany, uh, the surrender of Germany. Uh, so this is our map here in World War I. Uh, the German Empire here, the recently united German Empire under Otto von Bismarck, um, unites Germany in the 19th century. Uh, you also have the Austria-Hungarian Empire, Austria-Hungary, as you can see here, is going to be competing for control uh, uh, of Eastern Europe, especially um, with regards to Russia. They're both going to be seeing who, who's going to be the dominant power in Eastern Europe here. Uh, so the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottomans. Okay, the, the Ottoman Empire, um, really the, the most significant part of the Ottoman Empire that's going to come into play is modern day Turkey. Uh, although I should note, right, World War I is a world war. There's, there's fighting that happens throughout Africa, Asia, uh, even in the Pacific Islands. Okay, so th this is happening around the, all around the globe. So the Allied powers, uh, by that we mean Great Britain, Paris, uh, Belgium. Belgium's gonna take the, the brunt of it to begin with. Italy, of course, after a year, joins the side of the Allies. Um, Spain is neutral. Spain is actually undergoing a civil war uh, during this time period. Uh, Russia, as we'll see, is an allied power. It's going to stay in the war for about a year. And then Russia is going to drop out of the war because it's also going to experience a civil war, uh, the communist takeover of Russia, which we'll get here, get to momentarily. Okay, so the causes of the war. Uh, now, we've already traced some of the root developments that take place in the 19th century, specifically imperialism and colonialism. Uh, but let's deal with some more specific causes here. Uh, first and foremost uh, is the Austro-Hungarian determination to oppose its will upon the Balkans. Just to go back to this map here for a second. So this is Austria-Hungary. Uh, the Balkans, this area here in Eastern Europe, uh, Austria Hungarian Empire is looking to impose its control on the, on the nations of Romania and what's really going to be contentious is this small nation of Serbia. Now Serbia by this time is basically already a puppet state for the Austrian Hungarian Empire uh, but the Serbs aren't really satisfied with this. They're not, uh, they don't appreciate this very much. Uh, but Austria-Hungary is competing with Russia for control of the Balkans, for control of Eastern Europe. Uh, and this, of course, is going to create tensions 
tension primarily between Austria-Hungary and Russia. Uh, but what also happens in the 19th century is the rise of Germany. The rise of Germany. Germany is united under Otto von Bismarck. Germany, uh, before this time, called Prussia, uh, kind of a loose confederation of various German states ruled by various German princes, uh, it's united in the 19th century by Bismarck. By the time the 20th century rolls around, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II is the, the, uh, the German emperor uh, who is going to pursue a very aggressive imperialistic policy. It's towards the latter end, the later half of the 19th century that Germany starts to push and force itself overseas. Germany is going to colonize. Right, so we, we've been talking this whole class about how these European powers are spreading overseas, beginning with the Spanish and the Portuguese. Well, Germany is going to start to do the same thing, but again, it's late to the game. Uh, so Germany, you're going to see German colonies uh, start to appear in Africa, specifically southern Africa. Uh, the Germans are also going to uh, lay claim to a lot of uh, some of the Pacific Islands, um, Samoa, I believe. Uh, also, it's going to lay claim to several ports in China as well. And this is really where uh, Germany and Japan are going to clash during World War I. Okay. Um, but there's some other causes as well. So the first two we've already gone through, um, Austro-Hungarian determination to control the Balkans, to control that Eastern European region, uh, the German desire for greater power and international influence. All right. It's going to start competing for control of colonies. In order to do this, it's got to compete with the British Navy. Uh, this basically in the 19th century sparks an arms race with the British. The Germans aren't really con uh, concerned about the British Army, uh, but you also have to remember by the 19th century, as I said in the previous lecture, uh, Britain and France control uh, about 75% of the globe. And Britain is able to do this through its superior navy. So in the 19th century, uh, Germany is going to start challenging that naval power. Um, with the expansion of Germany, uh, once Bismarck unites Germany, um, the French lose territory to Bismarck. So there's some, uh, uh, some contentious relation there between the French and the Germans. Specifically around that Belgium border, there's going to be a lot of competition, a lot of claims to particular towns that aren't quite settled. Uh, and, and Russia and Japan, at the beginning of the 20th century, go to war. Uh, the uh, the, the Russian-Japanese War. And Russia actually loses. Um, the Russian and the Japanese go to war over control of Asia. Uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, Japan is the only non-European uh, empire, imperial, uh, imperialistic power. Uh, Japan is vying for control of modern-day Korea, parts of modern-day China, uh, parts of uh, basically control of the Pacific, the, the Pacific Islands as well. And it's competing with Russia. And Japan actually wins, and it kind of pushes Russia out of China, out of Korea, and kind of lays claim there. Uh, so Russia is anxious to sort of get its dignity back, having lost this war, and especially having lost this war to a non-European power. This is kind of, a, kind of an eyesore in Russian history. So all of this taken together, um, by the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there's this tangible expect expectation that Europe is on the brink of another war. So all of these factors kind of taken together um, suggest that Europe is ready for another war. People almost expect this. Some people actually do expect this to happen. Um, and then it will happen. World War I, uh, as you are probably familiar with, uh, begins with the assassination of the Archduke uh, Ferdinand, um, the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and his wife, Sophie. Uh, this sets off a rapid chain of events, okay? Um, it's, it's a bit simplistic to say that the assassination of the Archduke is what led to World War I, right? 
there's a whole bunch of stuff, a bunch of uh, behind the scenes political action going on here. Uh, but it is the, the spark that sort of lights the fire. So Ferdinand is assassinated uh, by a Serbian nationalist. Uh, again, Austria-Hungary, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire controls Serbia. It's, it's kind of like a puppet state. Not all uh, Serbs want this. A lot of Serbs, uh, unbeknownst to Austria-Hungary, Serbia uh, has sort of made this deal with Russia um, so that if Austria-Hungary invades Serbia, Russia has its back. Um, so the Archduke is assassinated. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia, in, terms, in turn, comes to the aid of Serbia, while Germany comes to the aid of Austria. It's this behind-the-scenes alliance that, that really causes this domino effect. And so this is what I mean by this, this rapid chain reaction. No one had quite expected, people were expecting war, but they didn't know. All of these alliances were kind of done in secret. No one expected uh, everybody to sort of go to war at once. And World War I happens rapidly. It's not like World War II. World War II takes time to get started. World War I is just kind of bam, it's started, it's there. Germany uh, from here will invade France, uh, then turn around, start to invade Russia. Russia's already on the move. It all happens quickly because the idea what these nations were preparing for. So they'd already known in their mind that war was coming, and so they want to be as prepared as possible. Um, so as soon as this happens, we're mobilizing. We're on the move. We're ready to go. And this is exactly what happens. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia comes to the aid of Serbia. Germany comes to the aid of Austria-Hungary. Uh, both Britain and France were in agreement with Russia uh, and soon come to their aid as well. Japan and Britain are in agreement uh, to come to come to start Germany. It's just, it just spirals out of control. And there's an analogy, right? World War I is a bar fight. Uh, and this is basically how it goes down, right? Sorry, the lights keep going on and off. They don't realize I'm still here trying to lecture to you all. So basically this is how it happens, right? You're, you're sitting at the bar or the pub with your buddy there's some guy over there that's starting to really get on your nerves. He's mouthing off. And you say to your friend, you turn to your friend, hey man, I'm about to go do something about this. You got my back. And your friend says, yeah, I got your back. And your friend turns to his friend and says, hey, if he jumps in and I jump in, you got my back, right? And the other guy says, yeah, I got your back. Right, so you walk over there, the guy mouths off, you pop him, and then it just spirals out of control. What starts as a one-on-one -on -one fight, quickly you got like six guys going at it. Maybe that's never happened to you before, uh, but this is exactly what happens during World War I, right? Serbia says, also goes to Russia and says, Austria-Hungary is looking really thirsty over there. Um, I think they're coming at me pretty soon. You got my back. Russia says, yeah. So within, uh, within a very short, short time span, not only have these countries declared war, but now they're mobilized. So the fighting begins very rapidly, very quickly. Um, these are just some numbers that don't really concern us here. That's for my in-seat class. Uh, so a number of technological developments occur. And one thing to keep in mind is that technology is advancing at such a rapid pace. I mean, we're kind of used to this. We're used to uh, a new invention or new like groundbreaking app or new groundbreaking phone or whatever coming out like every uh, couple of months or so. Uh, but most of this technology had never been used before. People, people weren't real. People didn't realize really what these machines were capable of. Um, and so you have some very important inventions technological advancements during World War I. Uh, artillery, machine guns, tactical air support, and poisonous gas. Artillery had been in use uh, since the Ottomans sacked Constantinople in the West, since the 15th century. 
Uh, but of course, artillery is getting increasingly and increasingly sophisticated. So you no longer have cannon by the time you have World War I. You have heavy, heavy artillery. Artillery capable of massive destruction. Um, artillery that was capable of reaching miles ahead. Okay, and it's mobile. You can, you can move it around. Right? This is something um, that they weren't quite ready for. Uh, but most importantly with this artillery is the, just the sheer amount of, of, of artillery shells they're able to, to lay down. Okay, people, so for example, if you look at uh, how these countries were preparing, so most of these European countries were preparing for war. And they're preparing for war by stockpiling ammunition because they realize, well, if we go to war, we're going to use this artillery and so you had people doing some calculations. Well, uh, if we use this much artillery shells per day for this amount of time, this is how much we need to produce. And so they produced it. They had all this stockpile. By the end of the first month of the war, they're reaching into their reserves because they've already used that much ammunition. You're talking about 30 plus thousand shells fired a day during, for one side during World War I. They just simply weren't prepared, right? They didn't realize exactly how many artillery shells they could fire or would be firing, okay? Uh, next, you have uh, the machine gun, the portable machine gun. Now, in the 19th century, you had the Gatlin gun, which was sort of like a, a big machine gun that you would hand crank, right? This is being used even during the Civil War. Uh, it's being used, it's, it's used during the, uh, uh, the, the war between Russia and Japan. But no one had quite realized its potential. Okay, it's, it's mobile, it's highly mobile, as you can see here, right? You get a two-man crew and you can move this thing around, one person feeding, one person shooting. And so what they start to do during World War I is lay down uh, fields of crossfire to be able to, to cover each other. And well, I'll, I'll get to the significance of this here in a second. Um, you have tactical air support, the very first time uh, that airplanes, uh, the airplane, as you may or may not know, invented by the Wright brothers uh, in the 19th century in America, uh, used during World War I primarily as a way to scout out areas, to locate enemy positions, to see what's going on. Uh, not really weaponized. It will be towards the latter half of the war. They'll start to attach machine guns to these aircrafts. Uh, but primarily uh, scouting missions and, of course, the use of poisonous gas as well. Um, now, when I say that they weren't prepared for this, you really see this um, happen when Germany first invades Belgium, which I think we'll, we'll get to in this next slide here. Um, yeah. So there are two fronts that World War I takes place. Um, and, it, and it happens because of the Scheifele plan uh, carried out by Germany, um, developed in the ninth, 19th century. Uh, Germany, for whatever reason, was concerned about being encircled. Well, I guess they're in the middle of Europe, so they're concerned about fighting on two fronts. So the Scheifele plan is developed in order to uh, knock out France very quickly uh, and then turn and fight Russia, so that way you're only fighting on one front. Um, the Scheifele plan takes place here uh, beginning with an invasion of Belgium. So the idea is that the Germans would sweep through Belgium into France in just sort of one quick motion, like a, a door closing, right? It's just going to sweep through Belgium into France, knock out the French army, and then within a few months turn their attention to the eastern Eastern Front. So this is the Western Front we're talking about here. And so you see this technology come into play. So the Germans mobilize. Not only do they mobilize, they've mobilized the largest army that has ever existed up until this time period. Right? You're talking about millions of millions of men that are making their way into Belgium within the first month or so of the war, 
an insane amount of people. We, we never, we've never experienced the, the, the sort of manpower that's coming through. And they're able to do this because the Germans have been playing for this for decades. They've, they've, they've gotten the numbers down to the T. They've already gotten the plan. They already know what they want to do. They already know where they want to attack. And so they're ready. And so they send it out, right? So they're, they're coming up through Belgium. But what the Germans haven't realized, so the army in Belgium shadows, is it, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny fraction of the German army. So the Germans don't think that the Belgians are going to be able to do very much, right? They think they're just going to sweep through Belgium and the Schieffelin plan, come down through France, take Paris, and then turn their attention to Russia. Sort of like it's just a, just a sweep through, like a door just closing there. That's the first part of the Schieffelin plan. Um, so they go into Belgium, and the Belgians decide that they're going to put up a fight. They put up a fight, they do. The Belgians had designed uh, this series of forts, right, crazy, crazy type stuff if you ever get a, if you want to go look it up. Very sophisticated, really, if you're into military history, it's really cool stuff uh, that they're able to do. They're, they're underground and they have these, these pulley systems that can bring up artillery and then bring it down. Um, and so the Belgians create this interlocking system of forts fortified by artillery. They create machine gun nests with crossfire. And so remember, the Germans had never been in, nobody had been in a war like this, but the Germans and nobody else in Europe was, was realizing what these machines were capable of. So the German tactics at first, they said, well, the Belgian army's waiting on us. Um, they actually had their soldiers fix their bayonets, put their bayonets on the guns, and march forward and eventually charge the Belgian lines. So they do this, and the front line of the Germans are absolutely cut down. They're slaughtered because the Belgians have machine guns set up, they have artillery set up and crossfires, and the Belgians decimate the Germans. So what do the German generals do? Again, they're, they're operating out, out of this outdated notion of battle. They send in the next front, and then the next front, and the next one. And you can read the reports by the Belgian soldiers of what happened, right? Eventually, it gets so bad that there are piles of German bodies laying there, and it gets stacked so high that the, uh, that the German troops start to use it as cover. There's so many dead bodies on the battlefield that they've created a wall of bodies, right? No one had ever seen anything like that before. Now, eventually, the Belgians fall. Belgium falls to the Germans. The Germans are able to make their way through. Um, but I, I give you that as an example of what's happening. And what's happening is, is mass, mass slaughter on an unimaginable scale. OK. Several important things happen, uh, just to kind of get through this quickly. Uh, the first Battle of Marne fought September 6th through 9th. Um, the Battle of Marne is sort of what results, it's typically considered, this is where trench warfare starts. The trenches, right, is probably what you think of when you think of World War I. These guys sitting in the trenches, uh, sometimes not even a mile away from each other, kind of dug in on both sides. And this is really where the war becomes a war of attrition. It's about grinding the other person down. It's just about throwing numbers at the other person until they finally surrender. This happens at Marne. Both sides dug in the trenches, began a bloody war of attrition, uh, followed by uh, several other costly battles, uh, Verdun and Simon, which unfortunately we don't have too much time to cover. Um, Marne begins with a what's referred to as the race to the sea. Um, that's a bad map. Maybe I have a better one here. We'll go back to this one. This is a better one. Okay, uh, so Marne begins, so this is, these are the, the German and the French lines, right? Uh, the Battle of Marne 
begins what's referred to as the race to the sea. Uh, and it's not like they're trying to get to the ocean. It's this idea that, so they, they dig down, and they're, why are they digging down? Why does trench warfare happen? It happens because of this technology, right? No one at this point, at this point during the war is stupid enough just to stand in an open field when the other side has machine guns and artilleries. So they start to entrench themselves, and there's this constant attempt Right? So we've got this new weaponry and we're dug down and we're basically at a standstill. Well, how are we going to win? We're going to try to outflank each other. Okay, so they meet here and there's a constant attempt to outflank by both sides. And eventually this ends uh, up in the, in the top region of Belgium here, it ends at the ocean. Well, actually it ends in Belgium. Uh, in Belgium as a, as a last result, uh, floods uh, the area of Flanders up in this region. Um, so that's the Western Front. The Eastern Front uh, fought on the other extreme between Germany and Russia. And I believe I have a map here. I don't. Eastern Front fought uh, between the Russian forces, uh, invaded uh, East Russia and Poland, stopped short by the Germans. Uh, the Battle of Tannenberg there is what causes the, the trench warfare on the eastern front. So on both sides, we dig in. On both sides, it's basically going to turn into this war of attrition. Who can throw uh, the most people at the other side? Um, and this goes on for years and years. The Russians, as I mentioned before, uh, eventually drop out of the war due to the Russian Revolution uh, led by the Communist Party in Russia, which will eventually lead to uh, Vladimir Lenin coming to power. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, Communist Russia during World War II lecture. Um, just to give you uh, a taste for this, so we, I mentioned that the Ottoman Empire was also involved in the war in modern day Turkey. Well, the British attempt to invade Gallipoli, attempt to invade mainland Turkey to take sort of the, take the fight to the Ottomans. Uh, Gallipoli, largely a failure. Well, not largely a failure. It was a failure. Was, the British faced a disastrous, humiliating defeat at the hands of the Ottomans. Uh, basically, the first and only attempt by the Allies to invade the Ottomans. World War I, uh, in addition to the, the, the technology that we talked about, also major advancements in naval technology take place. Uh, some really interesting stuff there. Uh, specifically, the German U-boats. And so Germany and Britain uh, have had this naval arms race for some time. All that comes to a climax during World War I, and um, of course, this is how America gets involved. Uh, Germany loses, it can't really stand toe to toe with the British Navy, but the Germans have uh, an upper hand as far as technology goes. They're able to use their U-boats in order to carry out submarine warfare on British supply lines. Uh, and of course, as you probably know, um, this leads to the sinking of the Lusitania. This leads uh, to sort of the, the moral reason why America decides to join the war. Uh, America, by this time though, by, the, uh, by 1916, 1917, has already been funding Europe, has already been uh, funding Britain, has already been sending supplies to Britain. Okay, um, by 1918, uh, Germany is basically just worn down. Um, Germany just simply can't stand up to the sheer manpower, the sheer volume of soldiers that are coming from France and Britain and America. Remember, even though there's, the British Army is not terribly large, the British are able to draw upon resources the Germans aren't. The British are able to recruit troops from Canada, to recruit troops from India, and even recruit, recruit troops from Africa. You have South Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, fighting in World War I alongside British troops. Um, and Germany simply doesn't have those resources. Uh, Germany able to build up its strength on the Western Front. Um, the, sorry. Um, the, basically, the strategy was to wait for the United States to arrive, wait until more reinforcements arrive. 
Uh, facing drilling resources on the battlefield, uh, discontent at the home front, uh, Germany surrenders, um, finally forced to seek an armistice November 11th, 1918. Uh, and this is when uh, the war ends. November 1918. So, another one of the important developments of World War I uh, is what happens afterwards. So after World War I ends, after uh, people start writing about it and start seeking out the causes and the origins of World War I, uh, one of the biggest questions is really who to blame? Who started this? Who can we really pin? Uh, who can we really pin this on? Uh, and eventually, as as you may or may not know, it, it, the the cause of World War One, why it happened, uh, is eventually blamed on the Germans. It's blamed on German aggression. Um, but from what we've talked about, you should be able to realize that's not quite accurate. Uh, if you're looking for who to blame, it's really a shared responsibility. World War I, as we mentioned, arises out of Western imperialism. It arises out of Western colonialism, uh, of this desire, this, this competition between the European nations, this sort of idea that, well, we're eventually going to go to war anyway. No one's really trying to stop it. it it's a bit, it's, it's unfair, it's anachronistic to pin World War I on Germany. But this is exactly what the Allies do. And as a result, Germany not only loses the war, but is also, also faced to pay reparations for the war. They have to pay the Allies, pay to try to compensate for their losses. And this is going to produce an economic situation in Germany, the fall of the German economy. And it's going to go in a free fall after World War I. And it's going to set the stage for World War II. So if you, when we're looking at the origins of World War II, why it started, you can look at the end of World War I. Look what happens to Germany. Look what the German people are forced to do. And this is where you get some of the uh, some justification in for, for, that, for that time period of why the German people felt the way they did. Why Hitler is able to convince people that the entirety of the West is against Germany. Because in certain sense they were. Germany's blamed for World War I and is forced to pay reparations for it. Okay, guys. Uh, that's all I got for this lecture. Uh, tune in for the World War II one.